Well, the first episode of our new serial, The Death of Grass, by John Christopher. It's 1956 and there's news of a disturbing virus causing crops in China to fail. But it all seems a very long way away from a valley in the Lake District. The valley was called Blind Gill, although Cyclops Valley would have been a better name for it, for it looked out of one eye only towards the west. The entrance could scarcely have been narrower. To the left of the road, ten yards away, a rock face rose sharply and overhung. To the right, the river Leap foamed against the road's very edge. Its further bank, fifteen yards beyond, hugged the other jaw of the valley. David Custance farmed this valley. His grandfather was buried here, and his grandfather's grandfather. And now he stood with his brother, John, by the banks of the Leap. He lifted his stick and pointed far up the slope of the hill where two specks, John's children, Davy and Mary, toiled upwards. There they go. Davy setting the pace as usual. You're a bad uncle, David. You favour the nephew too blatantly. Well, she's a good girl. But Davy, well, he's Davy. You should have got married and got a few of your own. Well, I never had the time to go courting. The dairy cattle will have to go anyway. They take up more land than they're worth. I can't imagine the valley without cows. Oh, there's a Londoner talking. The townies' old illusion of the unchanging countryside. The country changes more than the city does. With the city, it's only a matter of different buildings. When the country changes, it, it changes in a more fundamental way altogether. Oh, we could argue about that. After all, oh, the East... Oh, coming. And you ask me why I never got married? What I like about the valley is the high standard of courtly compliments. <laughs> Do you really want to know why you never got married, dearest brother-in-law? You're a hybrid. You're enough of a farmer to know that a wife ought to be a chattel. But being one of the new fangled university kind, you have the grace to feel guilty about it. You'll have to find me a nice masterful one, Anne. Surely you've got some women friends who could cope with a Westmoreland clod. They walked together in silence by the riverbank. The air had the lift of May. The sky was blue and white with clouds browsing slowly across their azure pasture. You are lucky, David. There's such richness everywhere. Look at this. And then think of the poor, wretched Chinese. What's the latest? Did you hear the news before you came out? Nothing official from Peking. It's supposed to be in flames. And at Hong Kong, they've had to repel attacks across the frontier. A genteel way of putting it. Did you ever see those old pictures of the rabbit plagues in Australia? Wire netting fences ten feet high and rabbits piled up against them, leapfrogging over each other until the fences went down under their weight. That's Hong Kong right now. Except that it's not rabbits piled up against the fences. It's human beings. And India? And Burma and all the rest of Asia? God knows. At least they've got some warning. They may be more sensible than the Chinese government was at the beginning. They'd isolated the virus within a month of it hitting the rice fields. They had it neatly labelled, the Chungli virus. All they had to do was find a way of killing it, which didn't kill the plant. We've been lucky. The virus could have hit wheat in the same way. It wouldn't have had the same effect, though, would it? We don't depend on wheat in quite the same way the Chinese depend on rice. Bad enough, though. Rationed bread for a certainty. Rationed bread? And in China, there are millions fighting for a mouthful of grain. Above them, the sun stood in a sector of cloudless sky. The song of a missile thrush lifted above the steady, comforting undertone of the leap. Their walk had taken them to a place where, with the river on their left, the path was flanked to the right by swampy ground. David bent down towards a clump of grass, whose culms rose some two feet high. He gave a tug, and two or three stems came out easily. Noxious weeds. This is rice grass. He pulled a long blade and held it up. It was speckled with patches of a darker green, centred with brown. The last inch was all brown and deliquescing. And this is the Chung Li virus. Here? In England? In this green and pleasant land. I knew it went for Lears here as well, but I hadn't expected it to reach so far. This? Just this? Thank God that viruses have selective appetites. Wheats are grass too, remember, and oats and barley and rye. Not to mention fodder for the beasts. It's rough on the Chinese, but it could have been a lot worse. Yes, it could have been us instead. Isn't that what you mean? We had forgotten them again. 
and probably in another five minutes we shall have found another excuse for forgetting them. David crumpled the grass in his hand and threw it into the river. It sped away on the swiftly flowing leap. Nothing else we can do. At half term, once the children had come home, the Custances and the Buckleys drove down to the sea for a weekend. Roger Buckley was the only one of John's old army friends with whom he'd kept in close touch. He was public relations officer to the Ministry of Production and lived in a world of gossip and whitewash that fostered, Anne thought, his natural inhumanity. She was reasonably sure he knew what her feelings were and discounted them, and but for one thing she would have weaned John away from the friendship. The one thing was his wife, Olivia, a rather large, placid, shy girl on whose warm understanding she had come to depend a great deal. They had good weather for the trip, and Saturday morning found them lying on sun-warmed shingle within sight and sound of the sea. John and the two women were happy enough to lie in the sun. Roger, more restless by nature, first assisted the children, and then lay about in evident and increasing frustration. All right, Roger, let's go and get changed. You've been tripping over your tongue for the last half hour. I think I'd better take you for a run down to the village. They'll be open by now. They were open an hour ago. We'll take your car. You're a bit jumpy, Rog. I noticed it yesterday. Something bothering you? This is the weather the cuckoo likes. When they sit outside, the travellers rest, and maids come forth, sprig muslin dressed, and citizens dream of the south and west, and so do I. Jumpy? Perhaps I am. Anything I can lend a hand with? The duty of a public relations officer is loyalty first, discretion second, and having a loud mouth with a ready tongue comes a poor third. If you were me, you wouldn't tell, honesty being one of your stumbling blocks. So I can tell you to keep it under your hat. Not even Anne yet. I haven't even told Olivia. If it's that important, perhaps you'd better not say anything to me. All I'm concerned with is that nothing gets out that can be traced back to me. Now I'm curious. What's up? What's up? is that Chung Li is ahead on points. But what about isotope 717, the stuff they sprayed the rice with? It killed the virus, I've seen the pictures. Apparently it was a complex virus. They've identified at least five phases by now. When they came up with 717, they had identified four phases, and 717 killed them all. They discovered number five when they realised they hadn't wiped the virus out after all. So, we're back where we started. Or not quite. After all, if they found something to cope with the first four phases, they ought to be able to lick the fifth. Yes, well, that's what I tell myself. There's just the one other thing that's unsettling. Phase five was masked by the others before 717 got to work. When 717 removed them, it was able to go ahead and show its teeth. It differs from its big brothers in one important respect. Go on. The appetite of the Chung Li virus was for the tribe of Ortsii, one of the family of Graminii. Phase five is rather less discriminating. It thrives on all the Graminii. Graminii? I've only picked up the jargon recently myself. Graminii means grasses. All the grasses. Wheat, oats, barley, rye, and that's a starter. Then meat, dairy foods, poultry. In a couple of years, we'll be living on fish and chips, if we can get the fat to fry them in. They'll find an answer to it. Oh, I'm prepared to believe that Phase 5 will not wipe out the human race. That leaves me my own immediate circle to worry about. I can disengage my attention from the major issues. Damn it, this isn't China. No, this is a country of 50 million people that imports nearly half its food requirements. We might have to tighten our belts. A tight belt looks silly on a skeleton. You're being alarmist. It's a long cry from the news that Phase 5 is out and about to a prospect either of a potato diet or the kind of famine and cannibalism that's been happening in China. From the time the scientists really got to work on it, it only took three months to develop 717. Yes, that's something that worries me too. Every government in the world is going to be comforting itself with the same reassuring thought. The scientists have never failed us yet. We shall never really believe they will until they do. The news of Phase 5 of the Chung Li virus leaked out during the summer and was followed by widespread rioting in those parts of the Far East that were nearest to the focus of infection. The Western world looked on with benevolent concern. Grain was shipped to the troubled areas where armoured divisions were needed to protect it. Meanwhile, the efforts to destroy the virus continued in laboratories and field research stations across the world. 
By a policy of destroying infected crops and clearing the ground for some distance around them, it was hoped to keep the spread of the virus in check until a means could be found of eradicating it entirely. The policy was moderately successful. Phase 5, like its predecessors, reached across the world, but something like three-quarters of a normal harvest was gathered in the West. In the East, things went less well. By August, it was clear that India was faced with an overwhelming failure of crops and a consequent famine. Burma and Japan were very little better off. In the West, the question of relief for the stricken areas began to show a different aspect. At the beginning of September, the United States House of Representatives passed an amendment to a presidential bill of food aid calling for a certain minimum tonnage of all foods to be kept in reserve to be used in the United States only. As autumn settled into winter, the news from the East steadily worsened. First India, then Burma and Indochina relapsed into barbarism. Japan and the eastern states of the Soviet Union went shortly afterwards, and Pakistan erupted into a desperate wave of Western conquest which, composed though it was of starving and unarmed vagabonds, reached into Turkey before it was halted. Those countries which were still relatively unaffected by the Chungli virus stared at the scene with a barely credulous horror. Those who agitated in favour of sending supplies were a minority, a minority increasingly unpopular as the extent of the disaster penetrated more clearly and its spread to the Western world was more clearly envisaged. It was not until Christmas that a new wave of optimism came. It might not be possible to keep the virus out of the fields altogether, but the Australians and New Zealanders had shown that it could be held in check there. It was in this atmosphere of sober optimism that the Custances made their customary trip northwards to spend Christmas in Blind Gill. On the first morning, John and Anne walked out with his brother on the rounds of the farm. They encountered the first bear patch less than a hundred yards from the farmhouse. It was about ten feet across. The black frozen soil stared nakedly at the winter sky. Have you had much of it up here, David? Perhaps a dozen like this. Looks as though you're holding it all right. Doesn't mean anything. There's a fair deal of evidence that the virus spreads only in the growing season. God knows what spring will bring. Then you aren't impressed by the official optimism. I'm impressed with this. John, there was something I... If you wanted to take a sabbatical year, could you? Of course. There's just the odd problem of keeping the family out of the gutter. I'd like you to come up here for a year. Is this because of the virus? Well, it may be silly, but I don't like the look of things. And I've seen those pictures of what happened in the East. It's very good of you, Dave, but I couldn't, you know. I may not always like the results, but I like working as an engineer well enough. How would you like to spend a year in Highgate, sitting on your behind? I'd make a farmer of you in a month. Out of Davy, maybe. I suppose we could come up here if things were to get bad. But there's no sign of them doing so at present. Well, I've been brooding about it, I expect. There was something Grandfather Beverly said to me the first time we came to the valley, that when he'd been outside and came back through the gap, he always felt that he could shut the door behind him. It is a bit like that. If things do turn out badly, there aren't going to be many safe refuges in England, but this will be one of them. Hence the potatoes and beet I've been growing. And uh, Did you see the stack of timber by the road just this side of the gap? New buildings? No. Not buildings, a stockade. A stockade? But a fence, if you like. There's going to be a gate on this valley, a gate that can be held by a few against a mob. Are you serious? Quite serious. His quiet earnestness impressed them. They were conscious, and particularly, of an impulse to do as he urged them, to join him here in the valley and to fasten the gate on the jostling, uncertain world outside. But the impulse could only be brief. There was all the business of life to consider. After all, if things should get worse, we shall have plenty of warning. We could come up right away if it looked grim. Don't leave it too late. In a year's time, all this will seem strange. Yes, it may be it will. The lull which seemed to have fallen on the world continued through the winter. In the western countries, schemes for rationing food were drawn up and in some cases applied. The important question, most frequently canvassed, was the length of time that could be expected to ensue before, with the destruction of the virus, life might return to normal. It was significant, John thought, that no one spoke yet of the reclamation of the lifeless lands of Asia. He mentioned this to Roger Buckley over luncheon at Roger's club one day in February. No, we try not to think of them too much, do we? I saw some pictures of central China last week. They haven't been published. And they won't be published. What were they like? They frightened me. I hadn't understood properly before quite what a clean sweep the virus makes of a place. 
Automatically, you'd think of it as leaving some grass growing, if only a few tufts here and there, but it doesn't leave anything. My brother is barricading himself in, did I tell you? The farmer? How do you mean, barricading himself in? I've told you about the place. Blind gill, surrounded by hills with just one narrow gap leading out. He's having a fence put up to seal the gap. I've never known him so uneasy. He even wanted us all to come and spend a year up there. Until the crisis is over. He is worried. Tell me, if I get you the warning of the crack up in plenty of time, do you think you could make room for our little trio in your brother's bolt hole? Do you think it's going to come to a crack up? So far, there's not a sign of it. Those who should be in the know are radiating the same kind of optimism you find in the papers, but I like the sound of blind gill as an insurance policy. I'll keep my ear to the pipeline. As soon as there's a little warning tinkle at the other end, we both take indefinite leave and our families and head for the north. How's it strike you? Would your brother have us? Yes, of course. Well, how much warning do you think you would get? Enough. I'll keep you informed. In a case like this, you can rest assured I'll err on the side of caution. I don't relish the idea of being caught in the London area in the middle of a famine. Spring was late in coming. A period of dry, cold, cloudy weather lasted through March and into April. When, in the second week of April, it was succeeded by a warm, moist spell, it was a shock to see that the Chungli virus had lost none of its vigour. As the grass grew, in fields or gardens or highways, its blades were splotched with darker green, green that spread and turned into rotting brown. There was no escaping the evidence of these inroads. And then, suddenly, good news. It was announced that UNESCO had bred a virus which fed on all phases of Chung Li. Once again, the atmosphere lightened. The combination of news of an answer to the virus and the imposition of rationing produced an effect both bracing and hopeful. When a letter arrived from David, its tone appeared ludicrously out of key. There isn't a blade of grass left in the valley. I killed the last of the cows yesterday. Even if things go right, it will be years before this country knows what meat is again, or milk, or cheese. And I wish I could believe that things are going to go right. It's not that I disbelieve this report, but reports don't seem to mean very much when I look out and see black instead of green. I'm not worried about the valley. We can live on root crops and pork. It's the land outside I'm worried about. The children went back to school, and for the rest, life continued as usual. Food rationing tightened gradually. There was news that in some other countries similarly situated, food riots had taken place, notably those bordering the Mediterranean. London reacted smugly to this, contrasting it with its own patient and orderly queues for goods in short supply. Not long afterwards, John was at the site of a new building, in the cabin of a crane looking down into the foundations, when he saw Roger waving to him from the ground. He waved back, and Roger's gestures changed to a beckoning that even from that height could be recognised as imperative. John cleared his morning and led Roger across the road to a small private bar which was not much used and which now, at 11.30, was empty. We've got to move. The balloon's up. What is it? What's happening? First things first, game set and match to Chung Li. We've lost. What about the counter virus? Yes, funny things, viruses. It still exists, but only in the mild and modified form that viruses usually lapse into. It won't touch Chung Li. Then they'll have to rebreed the virulent strain. Or surely they'll be attempting to do so. I don't know. I suppose so. It doesn't matter. Well, surely it matters. For the last month, this country has been living on current supplies of food with less than half a week's stocks behind us. In fact, we've been relying absolutely on the food ships from America and the Commonwealth. That's why I said it doesn't matter whether they do succeed in getting the countervirus back in shape. The fact is, the people with the food don't believe they will. As a result, they want to make sure they aren't giving away stuff they will need themselves next winter. I see. But they have to look after their own people. It's hard on us, No, but... that wasn't what I meant. These islands hold about 54 million people. If a third of that number could be supported on a diet of roots, we should be doing well. The only difficulty is, how do you select the survivors? I should have thought that was obvious. They select themselves. It's a wasteful method and destructive of good order and discipline. We've taken our discipline pretty lightly in this country, but its roots run deep. It's always likely to rise in a crisis. The army is moving into position today on the outskirts of London and all other major population centres. The roads will be closed from dawn tomorrow. If that's the best they can think of. No army in the world would stop a city from bursting out under pressure of hunger. What do they think they're going to gain? Time. Enough of that precious commodity to complete the preparations for the second line of action. Which is? Atom bombs for the small cities. Hydrogen bombs for places like Liverpool, Birmingham, Glasgow, Leeds. And two or three of them for London. 
I can't believe that. No one could do that. They will never get people to man the planes. We live in a new era, nor a very old one. Wide loyalties are civilized luxuries. Loyalties are going to be narrower and fiercer from now on. If it were the only way of saving Olivia and Steve, I'd man one of the planes myself. No. To drop hydrogen bombs on cities of one's own people. They're going to die anyway. In England, at least 30 million people are going to die before the rest can scrape a living. Which way's best? Of starvation, or being killed for your flesh, or by a hydrogen bomb? That's the theory of it. It can't work. I'm inclined to agree. You think the news will get out? It's worrying, isn't it? It's a funny thing, but I have an idea we shall worry less about London's teeming millions once we're away from them. And the sooner we get away, the better. The children. Mary at Beckenham and Davy at that place in Hertfordshire. I thought about that. We can get Davy on the way north. Your job is to go and pick Mary up right away. If possible, we should be clear of London by nightfall. I suppose we must. Take a good look around. Say goodbye to all this. This is yesterday's world. From now on, we're peasants and lucky at that. The two cars, the Buckleys in one and John, Ann and Mary in the other, drove north across the North Circular Road and through North Finchley and Barnet. There was no evidence of panic here in the outer suburbs. Trouble, if there were any, would have started in central London. They met the roadblock just before Rootham Park. Barriers had been set up in the road. There were khaki-clad figures on the other side. Ten bloody minutes! We can't have missed it by more. There would have been a much bigger pile-up. I wonder if the soldiers are going to be left to burn with the rest, I suppose so. Worth trying to tell them what's really happening? Wouldn't get us anywhere, and they might very well run us in for spreading false rumours. That's one of the new regulations. Then what do we do? Ditch the cars and try it on foot? Through the fields? They'll have the fields patrolled, probably, with tanks. We won't stand a chance on foot. Quite a few people will be trying to get through the blocks this evening. It, it will be quieter at night, and better in other ways, too. We'll keep your car here. I'm taking ours back into town. And there's something else I ought to pick up. Not likely to be any trouble in a place like this, is there? In that case, I'll come with you. Two will be safer than one if you're going south. Anne might want me to stay, though. For my own sake, not hers. She won't like the idea of any risk. From now on, if we are going to survive, we shall have to take risks and tell her that if we want to kill ourselves, wasting time wrangling is as good a way as any. This party's got to have a leader, and his word has got to be acted on as soon as it's spoken. Toss you for it, Johnny. No, it's yours. Call. Heads. Heads it is. All yours. Let's go. Back in London, Roger pulled up opposite a little shop displaying sporting guns. He put the engine in neutral, but left the motor running. There was no one in the shop except the proprietor, a small hunched man with a deferential salesman's face and incongruously watchful eyes. He looked about 60. Well, Mr Buckley, isn't it? I was just closing. Uh, <clears throat> anything I can get you? Well, let me see. A couple of revolvers, a couple of good rifles with telescopic sights and the ammo, of course. And do you stock automatics? Licence? I don't think it's worth bothering with that. You know, I'm not a gunman. I don't do that kind of business. Well, what about that little 2-2 rifle over there? Hmm? Roger pointed. Piri's eyes looked in the same direction, and at the same time, Roger leapt for his throat. John thought at first that the little man had caved in under the attack, but a moment later he saw him clear of Roger and standing back. His right hand held a revolver. Stand still, Mr Buckley. Uh, and uh, your friend. The trouble with raiding a gunsmith is that you're likely to encounter a man who has some small skill in handling weapons. Please, um... Don't interrupt me while I telephone. Wait, wait a minute. I've got something to offer you. I don't think so. Your life? Piri's hand held the telephone receiver, but he had not yet lifted it. He listened, without interrupting, until Roger had fully explained. I've been wondering if there were any reasonable way of getting out of London. And your tale does not strain my credulity as much, perhaps, as it ought. Living with guns, as I have done, one loses the habit of looking for... Uh, Gentleness in men. Right. Which guns do we take? First things first, uh, Mr Buckley. I'm going to telephone to my wife, Millicent. We live in St John's Wood. I imagine if you can get two cars out, you can get three. By 11 o'clock, the road where they'd left the cars was deserted. London's outer suburbs were at rest. But they did not move until midnight. Roger had explained his plan to John and Perry, and they had approved it, despite Anne's initial horror when John had told her precisely what it entailed. Remember, 
You and Millicent bring our cars up as soon as you hear the horn. Once they were near the roadblock, John parked his car and joined Piri in Rogers. Roger drove slowly forward, past the parked cars, along the deserted road. It had been reconnoitred earlier in the evening, and they knew where the last bend before the roadblock was. They stopped there, and John and Piri slipped out and disappeared into the night. Five minutes later, Roger accelerated noisily towards the roadblock. What the hell is that bloody contraption doing in the middle of the road? Get it shifted, man. Sorry, sir, road closed. All roads out of London closed. Well, get the flaming things open again. Get this one open anyway. I want to get home. Another soldier appeared beside the original soldier, and after a moment, a third. The three figures were outlined, mistily but with reasonable definition, on the other side of the wooden barrier. You clear off back, mate, all right? Why don't you try turning me around? Too many bloody useless tin soldiers in this country doing damn all, eating good rations. All right, mate, you ask for it. Come on, we'll turn this loudmouth bleeder's car around for him. They climbed over the barrier and advanced into the pool of brightness from the headlights. John felt sweat start under his arms and along his legs. He brought the rifle up and tried to hold it steady. He had killed in the war, but never from such close range, and never a fellow countryman. Clay pipes at the fairground, he thought. A clay pipe that must be shattered for Anne, for Mary and Davy. All right! The first shot came before the final word, and two others followed while it was still in the air. John still stood, with his rifle aiming as the three figures slumped in the dazzle of the road. He did not move until he saw Piri, having advanced from his own position, stooping over them. I must apologise for poaching, partner. There was such a good lie. Dead? Of course. Then we'll clear them into the ditch first. After that, the barrier. The body that John pulled away was limp and heavy. He avoided looking at the face at first. Then, in the shadow at the side of the road, he glanced at it. A lad, not more than twenty, his face young and unmarked except for the hole in one temple, gouting blood. He bent and kissed the unwounded side of the forehead and eased the body down over the barrier with gentleness. Roger ran back to the car and pressed the horn button and in a few moments they heard the sound of cars approaching. The cars stopped and Anne moved over as John opened the door and got in. He pushed the accelerator pedal down hard, and after that, for some miles, they drove in silence. Once they'd picked up Davy from his school, they stopped for a meal in a lane a little north of Newark. The fields on either side of them were potato fields, planted for the hopeful second crop. Apart from the bareness of hedgerows empty of grass, there was nothing to distinguish the scene from any country landscape in a thriving, fruitful world. One of the car radios was kept permanently in operation. When the news came on, the announcer's voice was still suave, but grave as well. In South London, an attempt has been made by an organised mob to break through the barriers. Set up yesterday... Now that we're clear, I don't mind them having the guts to break out. Riots are Good for them. To have occurred in several major cities. Notably Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds. Leeds. And in the case of Leeds, That's less good. official contact has been lost. The government has stated that in view of the disturbances in certain areas, members of the public are warned that severe countermeasures may have to be taken. I don't like the sound that of all this. Yeah. It looks as if we'd better travel while the travelling's good. Our minds can't grasp it properly, can they? The news bulletins, the military checkpoints, they're one kind of thing. This is another. A summer evening in the country. The same country that's always been here. A bit bare. Doesn't seem enough to account for famine, flight, murder, atom bombs. Motives are naked now. We shall have to learn to live with them. I wish we were there. I wish we could get into the valley and shut David's gate behind us. Tomorrow. I hope. When they set off, Davy had joined the Buckleys in their Citroen, which was leading the way at this point. Piri's Ford came second, and John's Vauxhall, carrying now only Mary and Anne in addition to himself, brought up the rear. Doncaster was sealed off, but the detour roads had been well posted. Meshed in with an increasing military traffic, they went round to the northeast through a series of little peaceful villages. 
As the Vauxhall approached a gatehouse, standing back from the road, the level crossing gates began slowly to close. Damn. I wonder if they might be persuaded to let us through for five bob. He slipped out of the car, walked up to the gatehouse and called out. There was no immediate reply, but then he heard something too indistinct to be an answer. It was a gasping, sobbing noise from somewhere inside the house. It was easy enough to see when he looked in at the window where the noise had come from. A woman lay in the middle of the floor. Her clothes were torn and there was blood on her face. One leg was doubled underneath her. About her, the room was in confusion. It was the first time he'd seen it in England, but in Italy, during the war, he had observed not dissimilar scenes. The trail of the looter. But here, in rural England. He was still looking through the window when memory gripped and tightened on him. The gates, with the woman lying here, perhaps dying, who had closed the gates, and why? He turned quickly, and as he did, he heard Anne cry out. He ran round the side of the gatehouse. The car doors were open. He could see Anne fighting with a man in front. There was another man in the back, and he could not see Mary. He looked quickly for a weapon of some kind and saw a piece of rough wood lying beside the porch. As he bent to pick it up, a length of pit prop crashed down against the side of his head. He tried to cry out, but the words caught in his throat and he stumbled and fell. Someone, Olivia, was bathing his head. Roger and the Pirries came out. Roger's face was grim. Pirries wore its customary blankness. Pirries' wife, Millicent, stood a little apart. You've probably been out about half an hour. We were the other side of the Leeds Road before we missed you. Half an hour is, I should estimate, 20 miles for looters in this kind of country. That opens up quite a wide circle. If you could, let me have a gun. They got away with the guns as well. I don't know if you could all crowd in the Citroen. If you could spare me the Ford. Take Davy. That's all. We're travelling as a party. If you go back, you take us with you. That woman's dead in there. You may as well know that. We'll find them. To hell with the odds. I've been examining the situation. Uh, if you will forgive my putting things bluntly, I'm rather surprised they should have left the scene so quickly. Why? Well, they must have spent more than half an hour in the gatehouse. You mean... rape? Yes. The explanation was seen to be that they guessed our three cars were together and cut off the straggler deliberately. They'd therefore be anxious to clear out of the immediate vicinity in case the other two cars should return. Which helps us. We know they turned the car back towards the North Road because they left the gates shut against traffic. But I do not think they would have gone as far as the North Road with their two new passengers without, um, stopping again. Stopping again? Looking at Roger's impassive face, John saw that he had taken Piri's meaning. Then he himself understood. He struggled to his feet. There are still some things to work out. There are well over half a dozen side roads between here and the A1. And you've got to remember they'll be listening for the sound of it. No, 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 it's obvious. They've taken the Vauxhall. We can find them by the oil trail. Blind! Why didn't we see that? Trail's a high word for it, mind, but we'll be able to follow the spots of oil. We've got them. We've got the bastards. At each junction, they stopped the car and searched for the oil trail. The third side road was on the outskirts of a village. There, the trail turned right. Roger spotted the looters about three quarters of a mile away. Three quarters of a mile. Give me ten minutes. I'll take the hunting rifle. Fire a few shots yourselves, not at them, but back along the lane. I fancy that'll put them in the sort of position I want. I'm leading this well, aren't I? Take it easy. You're lucky to be conscious. Every minute. The bloody swines. God knows it's bad enough for Anne, but Mary... Take it easy, with luck. Our friends along the road have got just over nine minutes to live. We passed a telephone box just now. Nobody thought of going to the police. There's no such thing as public safety any longer. It's all private now. So is vengeance. The shots rattled like darts against the shield of the placid summer afternoon. Then, in the distance, there were three more shots. After a moment, John and Roger crashed their way down the path Piri had taken. There were bodies on the ground. From the far end of the field, Piri was sedately advancing, his rifle tucked neatly under his arm. Listening, John heard groans. Anne had Mary cradle in her lap, on the ground beside the car. They were both alive. The groans John had heard were coming from the three men who lay nearby. Not as tidy a job as last time. It occurred to me that the guilty 
do not have the right to die as quickly as the innocent. It was a strange thought, was it not? I believe you have the right of execution, Mr. Customs. You finished them off. One of you. With flat, unhappy wonder, he thought, in the past there was always due process of law. Now law itself is a casual word in a ploughed field backed by guns. Looking down at Anne and Mary, he heard Roger's revolver crack once and again. Then Anne cried out. Roger? Yes, Anne? Anne released Mary gently and got to her feet. Two of the men were dead. The third was wounded in the thigh. Anne limped over to stand beside him. He looked up at her, and John saw, behind the twisted, tormented fear of his face, the beginning of hope. I'm sorry, Mrs. I'm sorry! Roger, how do I take aim? No, Mrs. No! I've got kids! This is not because of me. It's because of my daughter. When you were... I swore to myself that I would kill you if I got the chance. No, you can't! It's murder! She found some difficulty in releasing the safety catch. He stared up at her incredulously when she did so, and was still staring when the bullets began tearing through his body. She went on firing until the magazine was exhausted. There was comparative silence after that, broken only by Mary sobbing. That was very well done, Mrs. Custance. Now you'd better rest again, till we can get the car out of here. Masham was a small market town on the banks of the Ure. The road curved sharply just beyond the river, and John slowed down for the bend. The block had been well sighted. The road was not wide enough to permit a turn. John had to brake to a stop, and before he could put the car into reverse, he found a rifle pointing in at the side window. A stocky man in tweeds was holding it. There were other armed men, John saw, behind him, covering as Piri's Ford swept round in its turn, followed by Roger's Citroen. What's this? A convoy? Right, come on out the lot of you. What's the idea of the tank trap? Getting ready for an invasion? That's clever, you got it in one. When they come tearing up from the West Riding the way you've done, they're not going to find much to pillage in this little town. We might as well get things straight. Do I take it you want us to backtrack and find a road round the town? It's a nuisance, but I see your point. You see, as well as being a target, you might say we're a, a honeypot. All the flies trying to get away from famine and the atom bombs, we catch them and we eat them. That's the idea. A bit early for cannibalism. Or is it a habit to eat human flesh in these parts? Glad to see you've got a sense of humour. All's not lost while we can find something to laugh about, eh? It's not the flesh we want. Not yet, anyway. We inspect the luggage and we take what we want. You can see what it looks like from our point of view. I should say it looks like theft from any point of view. Aye, maybe it does. But if you've travelled all the way up here without worse than theft to your names, you've been luckier than next lot'll be. All right, mister, ask the women to bring kids out and we'll do the searching. Soonest out, soonest ended. They were not long in unearthing the weapons. Guns, eh? That's a better haul than we expected for our first. Just what do you propose to take from us? Uh, that's easy enough. The guns for a start. Apart from that food, as I said. And petrol, of course. Uh, we'll ditch one of the big cars. Will you leave us six gallons? We've got another 80 or 90 miles to do. Six gallons might make difference between our hold in this town and seeing it go up in flames. One car and three gallons. So you don't have women and children on your conscience. Nay, it's all very well talking about conscience. But we've got our own women and kids to think about. They'll take your town and they'll burn it. I hope you live just long enough to see it. The important thing is to get away from here as quickly as possible. As far as the rest of our things are concerned, I suggest we take three small cases for the present. In that case, I can get rid of these blankets. I wondered how long it would be before you realised you were carrying dead weight. Hmm. When I was considerably younger, I used to travel in the Middle East. I learned the trick there of hiding a rifle in a blanket roll. <laughs> Only one rifle and a couple of dozen rounds, unfortunately, but... Uh... It's better than nothing. I should say it is. Good old Piri. If we can't find a farmhouse with a car and petrol, we don't deserve to get away with it. No. No more cars. You're not starting to develop scruples, are you, John? Because if you are, the best thing you can do with Piri's rifle is shoot yourself. We're not taking another car, because cars are too dangerous. We were lucky down there. They could easily have riddled us with bullets and stripped the cars afterwards. We're going to have to do it on foot. 
Well, I'm all for getting hold of a car and making a run for it. That's not what we're going to do, though. What do you think, Piri? It doesn't well, matter what he thinks. He's got the gun. That means he can take over the show, if he has the inclination. But until he does, I make the decisions. Admirably put. I happen to have the greatest degree of skill in the use of a rifle, and I'm not likely to develop ambitions towards leadership. You'll have to take that on trust, of course. So democracy's out. That's something I ought to have realised for myself. Where do we go from here? Nowhere until the morning. There's no sense in stumbling about in the dark in a country we don't know. John felt a great weariness of spirit, as though out of the past his old self, his civilised self, challenged him to an accounting. When it sank below a certain level, was life itself worth the having any longer? They had lived in a world of morality, whose lineage could be traced back nearly 4,000 years. In a day, it had been swept from under them. But were there some who still held on, still speaking the grammar of love, while Babel rose all round them? If they did, he thought, they must surely die, and their children with them. And as he looked at the little sleeping group whose head he now was, he knew their lives meant more to him than their deaths ever could. But there were some who would choose to die well rather than to live. He was sure of that. And the assurance comforted him. ...times and had heard a rumble of noise long afterwards. They might have been atom bomb explosions. The question seemed irrelevant. It was unlikely that they would ever know the full story of whatever was taking place in the thickly populated parts of the country. And, in any case, it no longer concerned them. On the edge of Whitton Moor, they found what John had been looking for, a small farmhouse. John and Roger made no attempt at concealment as they walked up to the door, strolling as though motivated by idle curiosity. Pebbles crunched under their feet, a casual and friendly sound. The door swung open. The man on the other side was big, with small cold eyes in a weathered red face. John saw with satisfaction that he was carrying a shotgun. There was a distant crack, and at the same time the massive body turned inward like a top pulled by its string and slumped towards them. A voice cried something from inside the house and then there was silence. John pulled the shotgun away from under the body which lay over it. With a nod to Roger, he stepped over the dead or dying man and into the house. Several seconds had elapsed before he saw the woman who stood in the shadows by the side of the staircase. She was looking directly at them, and she was holding another gun. Her hand moved along its side, but as it did so, John's hand moved also. The clap of sound was even more deafening in the confinement of the room. She stayed upright for a moment, and then crumpled up, screaming in a high, strangled voice. Oh, my God. Don't stand there. Get a move on and get the house searched. A face. You take the ground floor. I'll go upstairs. He searched quickly through the upper story, kicking doors open. The final door led into a small bedroom. A girl in her middle teens was sitting up in bed. She stared at him with terrified eyes. There was a key in the lock. He went out, closed the door and locked it. The woman downstairs was still screaming, but less harshly than she had been. Piri came quietly through the open door. Mission accomplished. Oh, she had a gun as well. Are there any others in the house? Guns or people? There's a girl upstairs, daughter. I locked her in. And this? She got the blast in the face, mostly. In that case, my rifle. Yeah. Do you agree? Although it is a shame. A revolver is so much more convenient than this kind of thing. In addition, I do not like using the ammunition for this unnecessarily. We're not likely to replace it. Shall we call the others up now? Wouldn't it be better to get these bodies out of the way first before the children get here? I suppose it would. It took all three of them to carry the dead farmer in from the door and wedge his body into the cupboard under the stairs, followed by that of his wife. Then John went out in front of the house and waved. The women came up the hill with the children. We don't want to be here long. There are eggs in the kitchen and a side of bacon. Get it done quickly. Were there only the, the two of them? There's a girl upstairs, daughter. I locked her in. She must be terrified. I've told you, Olivia, we don't have time to waste on inessentials. See to the things we need. Never mind anything else. When they'd finished their meal, the men began picking up their guns, along with some homemade bread and cartridges for the shotgun. 
What about the girl? We can't leave her like this. What do you suggest, then? We could take her with us. And if we don't, I shall stay here. And Roger? And Steve? If Olivia wants to stay, we'll stay here with her. And when the next visitor calls, who is going to open the door? You or Olivia? Or Steve? Why can't we take the girl if Olivia wants us to? What makes you think she'd come with us? We've just killed her parents. I think she would come. Look, I'll give you three minutes. If she wants to come, she can. He led the way up the stairs, unlocked the door and pushed it open. The girl was out of bed. She looked up from a kneeling posture, possibly one of prayer. John stood aside to let Olivia enter the room, then closed the door and went downstairs. Some minutes later, Olivia followed with the girl. She looked from John's face to the bloodstains on the floor, but her face did not show anything. This is Jane. She's coming with us. Their journey, owing to the presence of the children, would have to be by fairly easy stages. John had planned for three days. The first march to take them to the end of Wensleydale, the second over the moors to a point north of Sedborough, and the third at last to Blind Gill. Towards the end of the first day, they stopped within sight of Aesgarth. The valley, which had been so green in the old days, now showed predominantly black against the browner hills beyond. Once John thought he saw sheep on the hillside, but they were only white boulders. The Chung Lee virus had done its work with all-embracing thoroughness. Anne sat by herself under a tree. He went over and sat down beside her. Only two more days of this. And then... And then everything's fine again? And we can forget all that's happened and start life all over from the beginning, can we? I don't suppose we can. But we can live what passes for a decent life again and watch the children grow up into decent human beings instead of savages. That's worth doing a lot for. We shall be at peace at Blind Gill. I wouldn't mind being there now. I'm tired. I don't want to talk about that or anything else. Leave me be, John. He looked down at her for a moment and then went away. As he did so, he saw that from under the next tree, Millicent was watching them. She caught his eye and smiled. They made camp for the night in Widale Gill, securing themselves in the angle between the railway line and the river, and John appointed the hours of sentry duty for the night before taking up position for his own shift. His thoughts turned to reprieve the Americans landing at the forgotten harbours and handing out canned ham and cigars, scattering Chung Li immune grass seed on the way. But he could no longer believe that there would be any last-minute salvation for humankind. Nature was wiping a cloth across the slate of human history, leaving it empty for the pathetic scrawls of those few who, here and there over the face of the earth, would survive. He heard a sound from the other side of the railway line, a slim figure was climbing the last few feet towards him. It was Millicent. After their few days' acquaintance, he was reasonably certain what the visit promised, and the calm effrontery of it made him angry. Millicent, what the hell are you doing? Shush. You'll wake everyone up. You're not on duty for another couple of hours. You want to go back and get some sleep? I can do without sleep. What's the matter with Anne? You know as much as I do. I suppose it wouldn't have affected you. Either what happened to her or what she did afterwards. There's one thing about not having very high standards. You're not likely to go off your rocker when you hit something nasty. I don't want to talk about Anne. And I don't want an affair with you. Quite apart from anything else. This isn't the time for that sort of thing. When you want a thing is the time to have it. You've made a mistake. I don't want it. Let's be grown up. I may make mistakes, but not about this kind of thing. I'm not going to argue with you. Just go back to bed and forget about it. Okay. I'll just try the spark test. Nothing wrong with a goodnight kiss, is there? She put herself in his arms. He had to hold her or let her fall. And he held her. They both turned at the sound of small stones falling. A figure with a rifle rose above the embankment's edge and stood facing them. Even carrying this, I very nearly surprised you. You're not as alert as a good sentry should be, Custance. I thought the eyeful you got the last time you spied on me had put you off. Or is that the way you get your kick now? The last several times I have borne with the situation as the lesser evil. Any action I might have taken could only have made my cuckoldry conspicuous. And I was always anxious to avoid that. Pity, nothing has happened between your wife and me. Nothing is going to. My natural inclination 
was always to kill her. But in a normal society, murder is much too great a risk. Henry, don't start being silly. I am not a person on whom humiliation sits lightly. Tell me, Custance. We are agreed that the process of law no longer exists in this country. If it does, we all hang. Exactly. Now, if state laws fail, what remains? The law of the group, for its own protection. I'm in charge here. The final say is mine. I would say, wouldn't you, that the final say is here. With the rifle. I can, if I wish, destroy the group. I'm a wronged husband, Custards. I hope you will not gainsay me my rights. You know the way to Blind Gill now, but you might have difficulty gaining entry without me. I have a good weapon and I can use it. I believe I should find employment quite readily. Do you concede me my rights? No! John! Stop him! He can't behave like this. It isn't human! Henry! I promise! To cease upon the midnight with no pay. Even I can recognise the appositeness of verse occasionally. Custance, do I have my rights? Moonlight silvered the barrel as it swung to cover John. Suddenly, he was afraid. Not only for himself, but for Anne and the children also. There was no doubt about Piri's implacability. The only doubt was as to where, with provocation, it might lead him. Take your rights. No! Please! No! She ran towards Piri, stumbling awkwardly over the railway lines. He waited until she was almost on him before he fired. From the hills, the echoes of the shot cracked back. John walked across the lines, passing close by the body. He could have been mistaken, of course. It might have been possible to save Millicent's life. He was surprised to find that the thought did not worry him. In the morning, a subdued air was evident. John had told them that Piri had shot Millicent, but had let the children think it was an accident. Anne came down to him later while he was washing in the river. He told her what had happened, making no attempt to hide anything. And if Piri hadn't appeared just at that moment? I would have sent her back down, I think. What else can I say? Nothing, I suppose. Doesn't matter now. Why didn't you save her? I couldn't. Piri had made up his mind. I would only have got myself shot as well. You're the leader. Are you going to stand by and let people murder each other? I thought my life was worth more to you and the children than Millicent's. I still think so, whether you agree or not. Darling, I'm sorry. You know I didn't mean that. But it's so terrible. And it goes on getting worse. To kill his wife like that. What kind of life is it going to be for us? When we get to Blind Gill. We shall still have Piri with us. Oh, John, must we? Can't we lose him somehow? You're worrying too much. Piri is law-abiding enough. I think he'd hated Millicent for years. There has been a lot of bloodshed recently, and I suppose it went to his head. It will be different in the valley. Perry will conform. By seven o'clock, they were all together and ready to set out. John had assembled the group and was about to give the order to depart when Perry announced that the girl, Jane, would be walking with him. Perhaps I should put it another way. I've decided I should like to marry Jane, in so far as the expression has any meaning now. Don't be ridiculous. There can't be any question of that. I see no bar. Jane is an unmarried girl, and uh, I'm a widower. Mr. Pirry, you killed Millicent last night. Isn't that enough bar? No. I don't regard it as a bar. Millicent had been unfaithful to me a number of times, and was attempting to be so again. That's the only reason for her being dead. You also killed Jane's father. An unfortunate necessity. I'm sure Jane has resigned herself to that. Come here. Jane? You speak as though women were another kind of creature. Less than human. I'm sorry if you think so. Jane, come here to me. They watched in silence as Jane went over to where Piri waited for her. I think we should get on very well together. And now, I think we can move off. On the western approach to Garsdale, they looked down to Sedborough. Smoke lay above it and drifted westward along the end of the moors. Sedborough was burning. Looters. It might not be so bad if we cut north straight away and cut through on the higher ground. We shall have to make the effort anyway. John turned towards Piri. He realised as he did so that although Roger was his friend, Piri was his lieutenant. 
It was Piri's coolness and judgment on which he had come to rely. I think we're going to need more than just guns. And there aren't enough of us. What do we do then? Hang out a banner with a recruits wanted sign? We could ambush parties as they came through. There's enough cover, about a couple of hundred yards. There aren't enough of us to make a press gang. We need volunteers. What do we do then? Make camp by the side of the road? Yes. Let's hope not for long. Between Boar Fell and Rise Hill, the road ran straight on for three quarters of a mile. There were figures on it, coming down towards them. This was a large party, men, women and children. Most of the men seemed to be carrying guns. With increasing assurance, he thought, this is it. This was enough to get them through any kind of chaos to blind Gill. There only remained the problem of winning them over. My name is John Custance. We're heading for a place I know up in the hills. My brother's got land there. Are you interested? Up and we're not looking for a change. We're doing all right. You're doing all right now. While well, there are potatoes in the ground and meat to be looted from the farmhouses. But it won't be too long before the meat's used up and there won't be any to follow it. So what then? I'll tell you what. Cannibalism. Wouldn't do any harm to have a look, I suppose. We'll see what we think of it when we get there. Whereabouts is it anyway? That's Mr. Custance's business, not yours. He's in charge here. Do as he tells you, and you'll be all right. It's like that, is it? We're to do as Custance tells us. You can think again about that. I do the ordering for my lot, and if you join up with us, the same goes for you. He tapped the revolver in his belt to emphasise his words. As he did so, Piri raised his rifle. The man, in earnest now, began to pull his revolver out. But the muzzle was still inside his belt when Piri fired. From that short range, the bullet lifted him and crashed him backwards on the road. It's a pity about that, but he should have known better than to try threatening someone with a gun if he wasn't sure he could fire first. Well, the offer's still open. Anyone who wants to join us and head for the valley is welcome. My name is Piri, and this is Buckley on my right. As I said, those who wish to join up with our little party should come along and shake hands with Mr. Customs and identify themselves. Here, more than ever, ritual was being laid down. For himself, John saw that it signified a new role of enhanced power. The pattern of feudal chieftain was forming, and he was surprised by the degree of his own acquiescence and even pleasure in it. They would have been taken a chance not to kill him. Even if he could have been persuaded to let you run things, he could not have been trusted. Was it essential that I should run things? After all, the only important thing is getting to Blind Gill. Your little valley may be peaceful and secluded, but it'll also be under siege. So there must be something like martial law. And someone to dispense it. The day of the committee is over. Well, even if there has to be one person in charge, that one will be my brother. It's his land, and he's the most competent person to look after it. Exit the committee unlamented. There's another reason why you must be in charge of the party that reaches Blind Gill. Someone else might be less inclined to see that point. 25 miles from Blind Gill, they found a deserted farmhouse with room for the large party to stay the night. John found a room in the upper storey, with a window looking down on the valley towards Sedborough. All the women are asking me questions. Which meat shall we have tonight? Can we use the potatoes up tonight and rely on getting more tomorrow? Why me? Why not? Because even if you like being the lord and master, it doesn't mean that I want to be the mistress. All these people, making ourselves into an army, led by General Custance, with the able assistance of his chief killer, Piri. You underestimate Piri if you think he's just a killer. I'm a killer too. A lot of people are, who never thought they would be. I don't need reminding. Piri's different. It's the way he's changing you that's so dreadful. Making you into a kind of gangster boss. The children are beginning to be scared of you. If anything has changed me, it's been something more impersonal than Piri. I'm going to get us to safety, all of us, and nothing's going to stop me. You don't imagine I like all this, do you? I don't know. Here's Roger. Raj! Come on in, old man. Piri and Jane are taking a stroll before dinner. Piri the wooer. Very sprightly for his age. You're looking after the knives, Roger. See that Jane gets a nice sharp one when she comes into supper and tell her there's no hurry to return it. No. We need Piri. 
The girl's lucky to have him. She's lucky to be alive at all. Perhaps we won't need Piri tomorrow. But that doesn't mean I take cheerfully to the idea of your egging on the girl to cut his throat during the night. She may try of her own accord. If she does, what will you do, John? Have her executed for high treason? No. Leave her behind. I think you would. Can't you see that fair shares and justice for all don't work until you've got walls to keep the barbarians out? Piri is more use than any one of us. He really is a leader. Note the sense of dedication, most striking in the conviction that what he thinks is right because he thinks it. It's right in itself. Can you find an argument to refute it? Not one that you would appreciate. Rog, you see the sense in it, don't you? Yes, I see the sense. I see the sense in what Anne says, too. He was about to reply argumentatively when he caught sight of their faces and memory was evoked by the way they were grouped. Some time in the past they had been in much the same position, at the seaside perhaps, or at a bridge evening. The recollection touched in him the realisation of who he was and who they were. Anne, his wife, and Roger, his closest friend. Yes, I think I see it too. Look, Piri doesn't matter a damn to me. I think he does. Getting through matters to you, and so Piri does. The sooner we get there, the better. It will be nice to be normal again. They reached Blind Gill and David's stockade at 5pm the next day. Piri and John were surveying the fence with respect when the crude anger of machine gun fire broke the silence and John ran for cover. When he looked up, he saw Piri's small body stretched across the camber of the road. There was blood underneath him. He saw that someone else had got up from the ditch and was running towards where Piri lay. It was Jane. She eased herself down beside him and took his head in her lap. She was crying. John saw at once that the wound was superficial. A bullet had grazed his skull with enough force to knock him over. It was very likely the fall which had knocked him unconscious. Waving a white handkerchief on a stick, John approached the gate and explained to the watchman their situation. After a while, they heard the sound of an engine approaching behind the barrier. Piri stirred, and before long was sitting up. That will be David. Anne. You could come along and have a word with him, too. Davy would like to come, too, I should think. And Mary. Oh, Piri! Why, what's wrong? I think they would be safer here. I don't think you should all go along there together. I see. Well, that tells me something about how you would act in my place, doesn't it? What's the matter? Nothing, never mind, Anne. You stay here. It won't take me long to fix things with David. They were waiting for him as he dropped into the ditch after his conversation with David. He saw from their faces that they expected only bad news and told them boldly what had happened. Hmm. I can see his point of view. He can make room only for you, Anne, and the children. He can't do anything. The others with him, they'd agreed he could take his family in, but... You take it, Johnny. You've brought us up here. We haven't lost anything by it, and there's no sense in everyone missing the chance because we can't all have it. The murmur from the others was uncertain enough to be tempting... It's been offered, he thought, and they won't stop me if I take it straight away while they're still shocked by their own generosity. Then he looked at Piri, his small right hand, the fingers still carefully manicured, rested on the butt of his rifle. I don't think there's any hope of my brother letting us all in. That leaves us two alternatives, turning back ourselves and looking for a home somewhere else, or fighting our way into the valley and taking it over. No, not against David. My brother put a fence across the gap between hill and river, but he took it for granted the river was fence enough in itself. If Piri and I go first and knock out the machine gunner, there's a chance the rest of you might be able to wade across. He stood with Anne as the final preparations were made, looking at the children as they lay asleep on the ground. We could have done it. We could have got away from Piri somehow, killed him if necessary. There's been enough killing of innocent people already. And now there's going to be more. Some of the things I've had to do to get us here. I couldn't have justified them, even to myself, except in the hope that it would be different once we got into the valley. That's why I won't pay for admission with treachery. Treachery? To the rest of them. All of them. It would be treachery to abandon them now. I don't understand. I don't begin to understand. Isn't it treachery to David to force a way in? David isn't a free agent. If he were, he would let us all in. And I have to do my duty duty. I see that now. That's what's important. More than our safety and the children's. The honour of the chieftain. You're not a person any longer. You're a figurehead as well. Tomorrow it will all be over. 
We can forget about it all then. No. You've half convinced me before, but I know better now. You've changed, and you can't change back. I haven't changed. When you're king of Blind Gill, how long will it be, I wonder, before they make a crown for you? The valley's defences were outlined in the moon's soft radiance as John and Piri waded their way past the barrier of the fence. There were two men on the gunner's platform and another three or four behind it, presumably asleep. Piri's rifle cracked viciously and in the moonlight a figure straightened up, cried in pain and went down again. Then the machine gun began to sputter in a staccato rhythm of sound and flame. It did not manage much more than a dozen rounds before Piri got his second victim and the deadly chatter stopped. It was clear that the crucial responsibility was to keep anyone from climbing the ladder to the gunner's platform. Suddenly, in an entirely natural and unforced tone, Piri called John's name and proffered his rifle. Take this. Why? You fool. I'm hit. John could see, examining him closely, that his shirt was holed and bloody at the shoulder. He took the gun, dropping the one he had into the water. There was another figure on the ladder. John fired, reloaded, fired again. The third shot succeeded. He turned to Piri, but Piri was gone. John thought he saw his body several yards downstream, but it was difficult to be sure. He turned back to his more important concern, the fence. Figures were swarming over the top, and one already had hold of the machine gun, tilting it downwards. Chilled and utterly tired, he saw the remaining defenders throw their guns away. Into this room he had come with David, side by side, to see the corpse of their grandfather. And in this room there had been the reading of the will, and David's guilt and embarrassment when they learnt that all had been left to him, money as well as land, because a good farmer will never, if he can help it, separate the two. Well, he thought, looking at the body on the bed, I got it in the end. Had there been a resentment for what his brother had? A resentment concealed even from himself? He could not believe it, but the thought nagged and would not be quieted. It's not your fault. You mustn't think it is. Everything's going to be all right. The children can grow up here in peace, even if the world is in ruins. Davy will farm the valley land. David wanted that more than anything. He'll do more than farm it, won't he? He will own it. It's a nice bit of land. Not as much as Cain left to Enoch, though. You mustn't talk like that. And it wasn't you who killed him. It was Piri. Was it? I don't know. We'll blame Piri, shall we? And Piri is gone, washed away with the river. And so the land flows with milk and honey again and with innocence. Piri gave me his gun. And when I saw that he had gone under, I thought of throwing it away. The gun which brought us here, killing its way across England. But I hung on to it. You can still throw it away. You don't have to keep it. No, Piri was right. You don't throw away a good weapon. It will be Davies when he's old enough. No, he won't need it. It will be peace then. Enoch was a man of peace, but he kept his father's dagger in his belt. He went to the bed, bent down, and kissed his brother's face. He had kissed another dead face only a few days before, but centuries lay between the two salutations. He turned away, towards the door. Where are you going? There's a lot to do. A city to be built. In The Death of Grass by John Christopher, adapted for radio by Jonathan Dryden Taylor, the narrator was David Mitchell, Bruce Alexander was Piri, and Daryl Brockis, John. Rebecca Egan was Anne, Gus Brown, Roger, Jonathan Dryden Taylor, David, Abigail Burdess, Millicent, Morag Cross, Olivia, and Andrew Mayer, Ashton and the Luter. The director was Ellen Dryden. The Death of Grass was a first rights production for BBC Radio 4. Well, tomorrow morning, Claire Balding brings you Saturday Live that rakes over past news.
The Sri Lankan cricket team has been attacked by gunmen in Pakistan. Their bus was ambushed as it travelled to a test match in Lahore. What happens when sport and terrorism collide? In the week that the Sri Lankan cricket team were targeted, we talked to one of the few Israeli athletes who survived the Munich massacre at the 1972 Olympics. In the studio, a man who...